Amen and amen and amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. I just get the sense that the Lord just want us to wait on him. And as I was listening to those songs, one of the things that was common in those songs, let us pray. Father, we come before you. The songwriter said, oh God, that it is in the waiting. The songwriter said that had it not been for the beating, the crushing, and the difficult times, I would not know how gifted, I would not know, my God, that these qualities and these attributes are in me. And sometimes, God, it takes the difficult times to identify, to underline, and to underscore who we really are, to point out our purpose. So when we find ourselves navigating difficult challenges in life, my God, we have got to understand because your word tells us that our steps are ordered by you. You know where we are and you know exactly, my God, what we need and you know how to get us to our destination. And so we just come before you this morning, understanding and recognizing God that it's all a part of the process, but it's in the waiting. The challenge for us, oh God, is the ability to wait on you. Why? Because while we're going through or going through, it may seem, my God, like there is no end in sight, but it's all a part of the process. Think about cooking a meal. You get a pot, you put water in it, you put it on the fire. If you're cooking soup, it takes a long time before the consistency of that, just that liquefied flowing water to change where it's much thicker. So if we look at ourselves in terms of a meal that is prepared, that's what you're doing in us. And for some of us, we may be in the fire and we're screaming, God, when will this end? I just pray this morning, my God, that we will pause long enough to know and understand that truly, oh God, that all things work together for your good. And whatever it is that we have to deal with and navigate, God, you are with us. You tell us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And as I shared before about the Pilgrim Progress, my God, when Kristen had to go through that tunnel where lions were on both sides and they were roaring and trying to reach at it, there were other, uh, others who have journeyed down this pathway and there are footprints and the instruction to him was all you have to do is to put your foot in those footprints and you'll be fine. If we can ignore the noise of the lions roaring, it is a distraction to get us to flinch and to react. But I pray this morning, God, that you will help us to be still. Spirit of the living God, we ask that you will come and we ask that you will have your way this morning. My God, we look to you and we say thank you in Jesus' name. We pray amen and amen and amen. Uh, he has given me a word, but I am going to be obedient. I'm not sure who this is for. I don't know who has <laughs> threatened you. I don't know who is causing you to want to give up and want to quit. But I want to read this and, 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 and then I'll get into the word. I, I've made myself available for him to flow through me. But I just want to read First Kings chapter number 19. Not sure who this is for this morning. But I want to say this to you that when the threats come, you know that you're close to where God wants you to be. Amen. So when the threats come, watch this and then we'll go to the book of St. Matthew. But I think it's important that we pause and, 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 and set this before us. This, my God, is like the praise and worship that used to go before the children of Israel. And when the praise go before the children of Israel, what I find when I read the scripture is that things became a lot easier for them. So we're sending the praise and we're getting our minds right in order to be prepared to hear what God has to say unto us. First Kings chapter number 19, and it says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Watch this. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, 
So let the gods, and notice if you will, the gods that are there, it's little Jesha. She's not talking about our eternal father. She's talking about the gods of this world. She said, then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, let the, let the gods do to me and more if I do not make your life if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Elijah stood up. He did great exploit for God. Killed out the false prophets that are there. Jezebel, who used to profit my God from these false prophets, send a messenger to Elisha and send it to the man of God and say, by this time tomorrow, I, I am going to kill you. I don't know who has sent you a message this morning, but I want to let you know that I have done battle this morning on my face. And, and, and if it is that the Lord just want me to stay here, take on the task and, 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 and navigate this with you, so be it. Watch this. And when he saw that, my God, he arose and he ran for his life and he went to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. Judah means praise and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that night to die. You are not going to die. You're not going to die. I don't care what Jezebel has said. And as I was preparing to preach on uh, the book of St. Matthew, this was just where I was processing and praying to get to this point. So Jezebel sent a message that you are going to die. But uh, let me say this to you, and let me tell you the reason why you are not going to die, because God has called you, and he has purposed you, Elisha, to do a specific work. So the threats of Jezebel should not cause you to deviate and turn and to go a different pathway. Jezebel says this to you a couple of days ago, a few days ago, a month ago, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that she is going to kill you. Well, I want to say this to you this morning, that Jezebel lied because you are still alive. Amen. I want to say this to you this morning that if, if, if Jezebel said this to you yesterday, she lied because you are still alive. And because she lied, I want you to understand that it is your purpose. I don't know who this is for this morning, but somebody, something has come and it has tried to distract you. Elijah stood up prior to this and he killed 450 of the false prophets. Elijah stood up. He stood up and he defended the gospel. And Jezebel, because of her reputation, she sent a message to him to say, by this time tomorrow, you're going to die. I want to say this to you this morning as we read from Nahum. Remember, I don't know, you, if we take the time just to look at what the Lord is doing with us and through us and around us this morning, he is building somebody's confidence. So let me get back to Nahum chapter number one. Stamonica, do you still have it? Nahum chapter number one and verse seven. And then I think if, 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 if he doesn't have anything else additional for me, I'll get into the word and I will share what he has placed on my heart for us. Nahum chapter number one and verse seven. I'm trying to get back there where it tells us that we need to just put our trust in him. Nahum chapter number one, I got it. Nahum chapter number one, it says that the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who put their trust in him. So I want to say this to you this morning, that your trust in God is not something that you can fake. It's either you put your trust in him or you don't. Amen. Your trust in God is not something that you fake. It's either you do it or you don't. And let me try. I, I, I'm trying to get to where I need to get to this morning, but I'm, I, I, I'm being obedient unto him. Let's go now to St. Matthew chapter number 16. St. Matthew chapter number 16. And let's start at 13. 
my subject to you this morning is simply this, hidden, hidden in God until your time is right. Amen? Hidden in God. And that's the key. Hidden, hidden. You are hidden in him. You are hidden in Christ until your time is right. And sometimes what we're going to look at is that it takes trouble. It takes a problem that needs to be solved to pull you or to take you out of hiding in order for you to solve this. Note this, if you will. You are created to solve a problem in this world. <laughs> Amen. You are created to solve a problem in this world. And this is the reason why your steps are ordered and mine, because God will cause you to see the problem that needs to be solved. And every time you go or you interact or you see glimpses or signs of the problem, something is provoked inside of you. And this is what pulls you out of hiding. Amen. So you can run, but you can't hide hidden in God until your time is right. Matthew chapter number 16. I'm taking my time. Promise you I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying to take my time. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. Matthew chapter number 16, we'll start at 13. It says here, when Jesus came, my God, to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? Watch this. So they said, some say you are John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others say you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So notice, if you will, Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? And look at their response, because this is important. This is critical. The response that they gave to Jesus was what they heard on the room of it. So they have been with Jesus for a while. Jesus is hidden. His identity is hidden in what the Greek call a mysterion or a mystery. His identity is hidden. They're walking with him. They're talking with him, but yet he is hidden. Uh, and, and, and so now he comes and he asks them the question, who do men say that I am? And their response is suspect. It is surprising because up to this point, you're walking with him, you're having meals with him, you're seeing him do things, but yet still you can't answer the question. Watch this. But he said to them, so notice Jesus understood that the responses that were coming, it was not from them. And look at what Jesus now said to them in 15. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So first he asked the question, who do men say that I am? They report what man says about who Jesus is. But now Jesus takes it one step further. And Jesus says, now I want you to tell me, who do you think that I am? And when the question went forth, there was just this period of silence. Picture, if you will, my God, the disciples are there and they're looking at each other. They're looking and maybe the, 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 the person who was the outspoken one, maybe the one who was the go-to, they're looking to that person to give some type of insight or information. And all you can hear, it's nothing. But Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? It's a poignant question. It is a question that you have to answer. It's a question that I have to answer. Watch this. And Simon Peter answered and said unto him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And think about this, if you will. So the question was, who do they say? Now the question is, who do you say? And Simon answered the question. And then Simon answered the question. It grabbed Jesus's attention. Have you ever asked a question in a room and the response, my God, just may, may, may have just surprised you. You may have asked your grandbaby. You may have asked your children a question. And when they respond, it surprised you. Simon Peter answered the question and Jesus said, Unto him, blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Watch this. And I say to you, watch this. And I think this is important. This is critical. It's, 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 it's important that when we read God's word, we take the time and we don't read it in a rush. The commas and the pause are there intentionally to point something out to us. Watch this. And he said, and he said to you that you are Peter, and there's a comma. 
So there's a clear distinction. He said to him, you are Peter. That's the clear distinction. Watch this. And, and, and then he, he proceed now and he says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And of course, the question is, what is this rock that Jesus is talking about? We err in our understanding in that we think that the rock that Jesus is talking about, it's Peter or, in, or man. And I want to say this to you this morning, that the church of God cannot be built on man. Why? Because we're fickle. We will change. We will turn. We will not feel great about something that is in his word, and it will cause us to move in an opposite direction. So now the question is, what is the rock? Peter re received rather divine revelation. So Jesus points it out in that he says, upon this rock, divine revelation, I shall build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Even though Peter's name translates to mean little rock, Jesus was not talking about building his church on man. He was talking about building his church on divine revelation. And then he goes on and he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and what you bind on earth, my God will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Spirit of the living God, we come before you. And there is this sense, oh God, that you want us to take our time. You don't want us to be in a hurry. You don't want us to rush. You don't want us, my God, to go ahead of you. But as you, oh God, have brought to our attention again, the image of, 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 of Christian walking through the lion's den in the pilgrim progress. That's what you want us to do. You want us to take our time and just to put our feet in the place that you have structured and ordered for us. And by us doing so, my God, divine revelation will come that will change the trajectory of our life. Father, we look to you and we say thank you in Jesus' name, hidden in Christ, until your time is right. We're going to look at the life of Jesus. Three things we're going to look at. We're going to look at, one, the preview. Two, we'll look at the preparation. And then three, we'll look at how he was positioned to do what he was called to do. Again, hidden in Christ until your time has come. We're looking at the life of Jesus. Three things we're going to look at. The preview of his life, what was foretold of him. We'll look at the preparation and how the preparation positioned him, my God, to be in the position that he was in. When you look at your life, when you look at the lives of other individuals who are in Scripture, what you will find is that you read their story. And you will find oftentimes that it is difficult times, my God, that causes us to know more about their character. It is difficult times that, 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 that identify some hidden or some latent skills that are buried deep, deep, deep down on the inside of them. For example, we know the story of David and Goliath. David, again, when you read the book of Samuel, he was called out of obscurity. He was called and he was anointed to be Israel's next king. Uh, Historian said David was probably about 13, 14, 15 the most when he was called. He was anointed to be Israel's next king. And even though he was anointed to be Israel's next king, David did not take what was spoken over his life and then begin to seek or to sought after the kingdom or that which was declared over his life. When you read the story after he was anointed, even though he was not among, my God, the ones that were chosen, David was the afterthought. Let me just take a step back here. Uh, so the prophet goes down to, my God, his dad's house in order to anoint Israel's next king. When he get there, my God, the man look at him and say, are you here? Did you come in peace? Because normally when a prophet visit a town or he visit a home, it simply means that there is something to be corrected. There is something to be fixed. I'm talking about hidden, my God, in Christ until your time is come. 
When he went there, he told them that, my God, I am here, my God, to anoint Israel's next king. We know the story. He paraded his seven sons, my God, before uh, Samuel. And when Samuel looked, and Samuel looked with this eyes as opposed to this eye, my God, the Bible said that God hid certain things from him. And when he went with the horn of oil, let me grab my oil here. So what they did in those times, can I teach this one? Morning. Can I teach this morning? Thank you. I'm going to teach this morning. So what he did, he went down to his house and then he paraded his seven sons. They normally carry oil, but the oil was in this container where it has this wax on top of it. So picture this being the wax. And when the oil was held over each son's head, the seven of them, it would not pour. Why? Because they were not the white person or they were not chosen to be Israel next king. And so when all of this happened and the expectation is that the oil would have poured, Samuel now realized that something is wrong. And so I, 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 he began to probe, he began to ask the question, why? Because he knew that God sent him there to anoint Israel's next king. And if it is that God sent him there to anoint Israel's next king and those who are before him, the oil did not flow. It simply means there has to be something or somebody else who has not come into my presence. Why? Because this needs to flow. This has to pour. And when the, 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 the oil was not flowing or it was not pouring, he asked the question, is there another son that you may have? And the answer was, yes, I have one, but I'm not sure. Maybe that's where you are this morning, where, by God, you may be, uh, uh, this may be the response when your name is asked. But yeah, you know, we have one, but. But Samuel say, nonetheless, go get the one that, you know, was among the initial <laughs> Hello? ones who were brought before me. Go get that one. And so they came and they brought David. And when David was now brought, my God, the Bible says that when Samuel held the oil over his head, the wax melt, my God, and David was just saturated, my God, with oil. And, 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 and the oil just ran from his head all the way down to his beard, my God. And it is in the presence of those who despised and hate him, my God. God where is 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 his identity is now slowly my God being revealed. In other words, David is coming out of the shadows and into the light. The only person that knew that David was a, a, a call to do these great things was, uh, it, it, it was a secret, if you will, between David and God, because while he's on the backside of the desert, my God, the Bible helps us to understand that all the Psalms and uh, uh, words that we read, David was writing love song, and he was writing these Thanks to God and God got a hold of what was in his heart and who he's getting ready to become. And now God wants the world to know that, good God, I found a man after my own heart, but he's out there in, in, in obscurity. And when he went and he called him, he's anointed amongst brethren that do not care much for him. But let me just pick this apart just a little bit and just share this to you because I said, I just feel like I want to teach and I want to take my time this morning. Let's look at the responsibility that was rest, rested rather on this young boy. David's role was to take the sheep out to pasture. So he would leave early in the morning and he would come back late at night. Look at the responsibility that is rested on this young boy. A family's wealth was measured in terms of their lifestyle. A family's wealth was measured in terms of their lifestyle. So David was trusted with this responsibility at a very tender age. Do you see how God positioned us 
in, and, and, and he used right circumstance in order to teach us. So I want to say to you, don't curse where you are. Don't, 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 don't be upset because of where you are. There is purpose. Your steps are ordered. All things work together for good for those who are called and love according to God's purpose. David is responsible for his parents, for, 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 for the wealth of his family, while his brothers are out there and they're serving in the army of Israel. David is anointed. David goes back and he tend to his father's sheep. Didn't do it and anything changed in him now that he has been anointed as Israel's next king. He continued to get up every day and he goes. On this particular day, the Bible said that David went to his dad and his dad said, I need you to take some food to your brother. Why? Because Israel is fighting and I need you to bring food to your brothers. Anointed to be king, still hidden. Nobody knows but his brother and his dad. David take the food down to the battle site. And when David got there, I'm talking about the things that draw you out, you know. You're talking about the things that draw you out. And these are the things that tell you what you are created to do, my God. These are the fights that it is only you and you alone can fight. David goes down to the battle. The battle is set. And when David get there, he heard Goliath hurling insult to God. And this did not bother the men of Israel. But it bothered him. It's an indication of what you have been called to do in the body of Christ. The things that are, are, are bothersome to you. It's an indication of the calling. But again, you are preview. You are hidden. Now, others are looking at these things that are going on in and around the body of Christ. They're not bothered by it, but you are. And it's a telltale sign of the things that God is calling you to do. He gets there and Goliath is hurling insult at God. David asks the question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And aren't you guys bothered by, and they're like, nah. Why? Because Goliath was tall and he was big and he was fearful. Kind of like Jezebel and <laughs> Elijah. Because again, now Jezebel understood what Elijah did, and now she threatened him, and the man of God ran. But I'm going to deal with that later. So now David, amidst all of that, is upset at the fact that this uh, fearful giant is hurling insult at God. And David said, no, 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 this is bothering me. And it was said in this, my God, in, in, in this setting that the man who defeats this giant, his family shall live and they shall not pay taxes for the rest of their life. And not only that, King Saul said, I will give my daughter to the man who, who, who takes care of this problem. There's a problem that you have been created to fix in this land. And you will know when you come in contact with the problem, everybody else backs away from the problem, but you run towards the problem. This is where David finds himself. David, go in the presence of King Saul. And when he goes into the presence of King Saul, he has the conversation and he said to him, I'm going to fight this giant. I'm talking about hidden until your time is right. He said to him, I am going to fight this giant. I'm going somewhere with this. And when he said this, they looked at him and they said, you are but a little boy. And I want to say this to somebody as the scripture saying, let no man despise thy youth. Ah, I just feel like I want to take my time this morning. And when he said that, he got into the presence of King Saul and he said, King Saul, I am going to take care of this problem that Israel has. Because again, you look at it, you have trained men, you have warriors, you have men who are trained to fight, but they're afraid of this job. And this young boy comes and he looks, he evaluates, he assesses, he said, I'm gonna take care of this. 
And now this is where we have to be careful because again, we are still hidden. Nobody knows who we are. We're still hidden. And because we're still hidden, the only persons, again, who knew up to this point, you have David's brother and you have his dad who knew that he was anointed to be Israel's next king. So now he goes into the presence of King Saul. And when he gets into the presence of King Saul, King Saul says, uh, why should I even trust you to take on this task? You're but a little boy. And when they continue to discredit and to try ways in order to talk him out, David said, you know what? I walked with my resume and I want to show you what is on my resume. And King Saul said, your, your, your resume? He said, yes, but you're still but a little boy. And David, Stamonica, he pulled out his resume. And when he pulled out his resume, David began to say to King Saul, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that you're hidden, but because you are hidden, there are some things, there are some conversation, there are things that God has revealed to you while you are hidden. And now the opportunity now presents itself for you to step forward. When they question why they should give you the opportunity, David took out his resume and he said, uh, King Saul, you know what? One day I was tending to my father's sheep, and when I was tending to my father's sheep, uh, a beer came and it took one of uh, my, 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 my father's sheep, and I slew the beer, and I took the sheep out of his mouth and brought it back to the fold. And King Saul said, you did that? David said, yes. David said, on another occasion, I was tending to my father's sheep, uh, and, and one was missing, and I... Uh, uh, I, I understand the responsibility that rests on my shoulder and I can't go home without the sheep. And so David said, I went searching. And when I went searching, I noticed that there is a lion that had one in his mouth and I grabbed the lion by the beard and I slew the lion and I took the sheep out of his mouth. And if you give me this opportunity, this uncircumcised Philistine will face the same demise. King Saul said, okay, 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 you killed a lion and, 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 and a bear. Okay, let me prepare you for this. And the Bible said that King Saul took, I, 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 I'm talking about hidden in Christ, you know. King Saul took his armor and his raiment and he put it on David. And when David put it on and he began to try and move and uh, take certain battle position. David realized that it was restricted and it was limiting what he was capable of doing. And a part of you coming out of the shadows and into the light is that you have to be true to yourself and false to no man. I'm going to say that again for somebody. A part of you coming out of the shadows and into the light is that you have to be true to yourself and false to no man. David, look at King Saul and he said, I've not proven these. I don't know how to fight in these. If I were to go into the battle with these, I am going to lose the fight. I'm going to fight this fight the way God tells me how to fight this fight. And King Saul looked at him and said, well, what is it that you have? Or how are you going to fight this battle? And David said, sir, I've got a sling and I've got a stone and I've got sandals on my feet and I am going in the name of the Lord. King Saul looked at him and I'm sure they would have made funeral plans for David. I'm talking about the things that call you out of obscurity. I'm talking about the challenges. I'm talking about the problem that you have been called to fix in this world. And these are the problems that every time you go around it and others are in the presence of these problems, they do absolutely nothing about it, but it gnaws at you. And this is an indication of the problem that you have been called to solve in the body of Christ. We know the story. David, he ran towards Goliath. And when he ran towards Goliath, he took the sling and the stone. We know he hurled it and God guided the stone and hit Goliath in his forehead. He fell forward. And normally when you take a projectile and you hit 
an object, the force of that object causes, my God, that object to fall backwards. He falls flat on his face. David killed him, cut his head off. David is now celebrated, but he is hated. Have you ever been there? where you're celebrated, but you're hated. Celebrated because now they're saying the problem that Israel faced, it is now taken care of. However, you are hated because now uh, 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 the ladies now begin to sing the song, Saul has killed his thousand, but David his 10,000. And David now is a marked man. Call out of obscurity. But I want to say this to you, even though you're called out of obscurity, there are going to be some opposition and challenge to you get into your destination. Can I talk about Jesus now? Jesus, talking about a preview, there's a problem in this world. In that, there were systems that were set in place in order to alleviate sin. We had what was called the Day of Atonement. It was a day that was set aside where people would travel from far. They would travel from far. It was a central location that they would come to. And at this central location, they would bring offerings. They would bring sin offering based on the nature of the sins that they have committed over that year. And they would come, they would bring it, my God, and they would bring it before the priest. It would be examined. If it had no blemish, if it had no cut, if it had no scratch, it was then passed on and their sin offering would be accepted. The problem or the issue with this is that we know that when man has to overlook or look at anything that God gets or puts in place, man always seems to profit from what God wants. And the problem with this is that people would travel with all of these uh, 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 animals that they brought. And the issue number one was at the examination table because if there were any scratch, that animal was rejected. And the animal was rejected and it was put in a pile over there. And now because of the importance of this moment, they had animals that they had where you now had to go and to purchase an animal. And if you ever travel from one country to the next, you know now you have to exchange money. And when you have to exchange money, the rate will change based on the time. The inflation of what was going on because of the moment it was so crazy that people would go. And again, because so much was riding on this moment, they would have to pretty much empty out everything they had in order to get the right animal in order to sacrifice so that the sins that they bore can be forgiven. The rejected animals, they were collected in a pile and then come next year, it is the rejected animals that were recycled and they made their way over here. Hence the problem. The question was asked, who shall I send to, a, to, 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 to redeem Adam's last race? Jesus Christ in heaven says, here I am, Father, send me. And so when we now are looking at Jesus, we're looking at the preview. We know that the angel came and he spoke to Mary. Mary, thou art highly favor of God. You are going to have the Christ child. So when we go to St. Matthew chapter number two, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this morning. St. Matthew chapter number two, when we get through St. Matthew chapter number two, and we look, we start at one, it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. So we know it was foretold that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Jesus Christ is now born. And a preview to his birth is the Bethlehem star that's in the sky. Now everyone know that things, the political climate, the, 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 the religious climate, everything is getting ready to change. But at this point, Jesus was still hidden. Because remember this, uh, when we go now and you read Luke chapter number two, 
We talk about Jesus being hidden until the time is right. You go to Luke chapter number two. And when you get to Luke chapter number two, if you start reading at about verse 22, it says, as it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord and to offer sacrifice according to what is said of the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons. And behold, my God, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. My God, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Talking about Jesus Christ being hidden. And it takes divine revelation at times to reveal who you are and who you're getting ready to be. Watch this. And it had been revealed to him. I'm at verse 26 in Luke chapter number two. And it had been revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he see the Christ child. And just like God's promise was to Elijah, you are not going to die until you see these things. Elijah, don't listen to Jezebel threatening you because you're not going to die. Because God has made some promises to you just like he has made some promises here to Simeon. Watch this. I'm going to read 26 again for somebody. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before we see the Christ child. So he came, my God, by the Spirit to the temple. And when the parents, my God, brought Jesus, my God, to do according to the customs of the Lord, which was to circumcise and to bless the child. Watch this. He took him in his arms and he said, Lord, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your words. For my eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared before the face of all the people. A light to bring revelation to the Gentile, my God, and the glory of his people. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the rise and the fall of many in Israel, for a sign of my God shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Hidden. And it takes God's divine revelation to identify who you are. When Jesus was conceived, it was Elizabeth, it was Mary, and it was Joseph who knew who this child was. Elizabeth, Mary, and Joseph who knew who this child was. So now she goes to the temple. And now more information is added about this child. And the Bible said that when these things are spoken, Mary and Joseph stood there and they marveled. Hidden until your time is right. And you see, this is the thing about the mystery or the mysterion of who you are. You are hidden in Christ until your time is right, and it takes divine revelation to begin to talk to you about your future and your expected end. Let me read one more passage of scripture here, talking about the preview. Jesus is now born. We know the story that he is, uh, after he is born, the wise men, they came, as we read in, Math, in Matthew chapter number two, the wise men tell him to take the child and go because Herod is threatening the, the, life, the, the child's life. The next thing we know about Jesus is that at 12 years old, they go again to celebrate the Day of Atonement. When they go, they journey on their way back. Jesus is missing. How is it possible that this child could be missing? Again, you've got to immerse yourself in the time in which they live, understood how they travel. They travel in what they call a caravan style. If you have ever watched Western movie and you see how they travel, where there's this long train of people, the women and the children will go up ahead and the men would be in the rear. And they, if anything were to happen, once the men get there, they would take care of it. 
They are a day's journey going back home. Mary looked at Joseph and said, where is my baby? And he said, I thought he was with you. And Mary says, no, where is my baby? Where is my child? I want my child. You told me you would do this. They searched among my God, everyone, and, and, and Jesus was not there. Now they decide we're going to go back and we're going to trace our steps back. Talking about hidden and a preview of what is to come. They trace their steps back. And when they did, they go into the temple. And when they did, the Bible said that Jesus is sitting amongst the lawyers and the doctors. And they're asking him questions that he can answer. And he's asking them questions to which they can't answer. And the question was now evoked amidst all of that. Whose child is this? Whose child is this? How is it that you know as much as you know? And we know that Mary and Joseph, they came in and they asked the question, why have you done this to us? And this child, Jesus, looked at them and says, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? And then all of a sudden, we hear nothing of Jesus. So in those three passages, we get a preview of who he is and what he's getting ready to do, what he's getting ready to become. And so after the preview, next is the preparation. So between the ages of 12 and 30, the scripture is silent. There is nothing that is said about Jesus. They call it the silent years. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus got up on this particular day, Sister Monica, and he took off the carpenter's apron. And the time in which they lived was of such that if your father was a carpenter, the expectation is that you would follow suit. So we know that Jesus followed in the steps of his father, Joseph, and he was a carpenter by trade. On this particular day, divine revelation says, call his name and said, your time is ready. Jesus is coming out of obscurity. He is coming out of the shadows and he is coming into the light. He took off the carpenter's apron. He kissed Mary goodbye and he said, mom, remember that conversation I had with you when I was 12? Nah, the time has now come. Remember the conversation that Simeon had with you when I was just eight days old? And Mary probably look at him and go, how do you know? Oh, I forgot. You're the son of God. Yes. And he took off the carpenter's apron and he said, I must be about my father's business. And now he begins to walk. He met his cousin, John the Baptist before. I'm teaching this one, Mr. Monica. He met his cousin, John the Baptist before. And when they met, Mary was pregnant with Jesus. Elizabeth was pregnant with John. And the scripture says that when they saluted each other or they greeted each other, the babies in both mothers' womb leapt. But the Bible says this about John, that he was filled with the spirit from birth. Where are you going with this preacher? He's walking down the Jordan. And then all of a sudden, what was in John saw Jesus and he identified them, he pointed him out. My question to you as we think and we journey through this, Sister Allison, is this. How is it that it was only John the Baptist alone who knew that it was Jesus? How is it that he's walking, but he pointed him out and he said that here comes the son of God who take it away the sins of the world. The crowd stood still and they looked in the direction of Jesus. And I'm going to answer your question because you see, Jesus is not recognized. He's always revealed. So the Christ in you may not be recognized, but it takes divine revelation for God to reveal who and what is in you to others. So when John the Baptist saw him coming, John the Baptist ah, knew who he was because of divine revelation. He pointed him out and the crowd then looked. And when the crowd looked, Jesus made his way 
into the water where John the Baptist was baptizing people. John the Baptist, let me just share a little bit about him. He had one mission. His mission was to prepare the way. John the Baptist, if you were to go to his church, Sister Pam, his message was, to, was the same, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist was consistent with that which he was called to do. He steps into the water. And for the first time, John the Baptist sees Jesus in the flesh. He knew him in the spirit, but for the first time, he sees him in the flesh. And John the Baptist and his cousin Jesus engage in a conversation. Jesus says, baptize me. John the Baptist says, no, this ought not to be. Jesus says, nevertheless, suffer it to be so that the scripture can be fulfilled. Jesus is immersed in the water. And the Bible said that when he came up outside of the water, Stamonica, the Bible said that a voice spoke from heaven and Everybody who was around heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So those who were there who were onlookers and unbelievers, they heard the voice. And this is the first time in scripture where we get to see an image of the Holy Spirit, because the Bible said that there was a dove that descended on him, my God, as, as, as the Holy Spirit. So we saw now uh, the Holy Spirit descending on him. We see Jesus embodied in the flesh, and we heard the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm taking my time. After he was baptized, the Bible said that he was now the, 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 the spirit drove him into the desert to be tested and to be prepared. It took me all of that to get to this and to help you to understand that you are in your desert season and God is preparing you for your greater. The Bible said that when he went into the desert, Satan came to see about him for the 40 days and the 40 nights that he was there. And the Bible said that Satan tempted him. And when the enemy tempted him, we know that he came and he says, if thou be the son of God, bow down and worship. If thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If thou be the son of God, let me take you on the high pinnacle of this temple. Cast yourself down. Because the Bible says, again, the enemy knows the scripture and the enemy is saying to him that if thou be my God, the son of God, cast yourself down because he will send his angels and he will give uh, his angels charge over you. Jesus never acknowledged him, but what Jesus did, he rebuked him. He rebuked him using the word. So I want to say this to you, that while you're in your desert season and you are being tempted and you're being tested and you are being tried, I want to say this to you on the other side of your desert experience, my God, your greater is coming. Can I share another story about this desert experience? When you look at the story of Moses, good God, we see again that Moses was born. My God, there were threats that was out there in that every child under the age of two ought to be killed. We know the story with Moses. His mother took him, made bulrush, put him on the Nile, and my God, send him off. Think about the pain and the hurt and the heartache that this mother had to endure. But God is up to something. And I want to say this to you, not because it looks the way it does. Now again, God gives a preview of who uh, you are, and now he is preparing you. My God, the Bible said that Moses' little sister ran down the bank of the Nile. Look at where, my God, this, 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 this ark is going, if you will, and it came into the presence of Pharaoh's God. You are a problem. I mean, you are created to solve a problem in this world. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, right, and they brought the child to her, Pharaoh's daughter, Stamonica, Pharaoh's daughter had a problem. Her womb was shut up and she could not give birth to a child. 
Do you see how the hand of God is orchestrating this? Because now she can't give birth to a child. And the very thing that she desired the most that will take the pain and the suffering from her God has aligned this in such a way that my God, Moses, will relieve my God the stress of having to deal with something that society can't fix. The Bible said that she pulls him out of the water because she pulls him out of the water. She named him Moses. Moses grew up in fear. Moses lived to be 120 years old. The first 40 years of his life he spent in the palace and he is learning the etiquette of the palace, how to carry himself and how to present himself. So he understands, he is schooled with the best of them. Now that he's schooled with the best of them, I'm talking about the problem that caused you to understand who you are and your purpose, you know. Moses go down and he sees these people and deep down on the inside, uh, maybe this is where you are, you externally, good God of my salvation, you dress like an Egyptian, but deep down on the inside, you're a Hebrew. And so it takes a problem to create this separation. Remember last week I talk, talked about the declutter and then I talked about the divide, my God, and I talk about the deliverance. So God now calls him to go down and he see these Hebrews that are fighting amongst themselves. And Moses get in the middle of it and he said, listen, man, your brothers, you're not to be fighting and doing this. And so he separated, goes again. And there was this uh, person who was in charge, who was whooping one of the man, Moses, righteous indignation swells up inside of him. Moses got off the horse and he killed the man. The two men got into a fight again. And then the persons whom life he saved look at him and says, are you going to kill me like you kill the servant guard? Now the problem comes and Moses has to now run for his life. Now, where do you think Moses ran? Moses ran into the desert. Every child of God ought to have a desert experience. Why? Because your greater comes on the other side of the desert experience, hidden until your time is right. Moses is now in the desert, and like Jesus, he's going through the testing, and he's going through the preparation, and he's going through where all of these areas in his life are now being developed. Jesus rejected the, 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 the advances of the enemy. Three temptation that we all face just like Jesus. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Jesus passed them with flying colors. Moses' story, it's a little bit different because Moses has so much of Egypt inside of him. Now Jesus had to get all of that out of him. And could it be that you are having an extended stay in your desert because you are refusing to let go and to allow the Holy Spirit to declutter and to get rid of the things that needs to be far removed over or out of your life? Moses go through the decluttering process where he has his own authentic experience as to who God is. God reveals himself to Moses in the desert. And sometimes God has to get you away from everybody so there are no distractions. So now Moses go through the process and, and, and his mind, his heart, and everything is now decluttered to understand his true purpose. And now God says to Moses, while he is preparing him in the desert, I need you to go back to Pharaoh. And I need you to tell him to let my people go. We know the story. Moses now begins to complain to God because he's saying, God, 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 I can't, 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 can
you were hidden in me. The oil did not flow on somebody else. It flowed on you and I've called you and I've tasked you to go and to do this work. I'm trying to get through this and I'm trying not to rush. Moses is now positioned to go deliver God's people. He goes to Pharaoh and he stand under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And he said, Pharaoh, I came to talk with you. He said, what is it you have to say? The Lord said, let my people go. Who is he? The I am that I am. On 10 different occasions, he had the conversation with Pharaoh to let God's people go and he would not. Jesus is now positioned after he gets out of the Jordan. He handpicked 12, three and a half years to turn the world upside down. And he begins to go through the decluttering process and to say stuff like this to them that you have caused your tradition, your tradition have caused the word of God to be of no effect because you put so much on people that my God, that, 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 that it becomes difficult for them just to simply do that which God has called them to do. Sister Pam, in the time in which they lived, there were 643 laws that they had to obey. So when you read the scripture and it talks about the laws, there were 643 laws that they, every single person had to obey those. And think about committing 643 laws to memory. And now Jesus come and he boils it down to just a single one. He says, love your, your, love your, your neighbors as you love yourself. Because it all comes down to love. Hidden in Christ until your time is right. Jesus now became a mark man. Why? Because he dare stand up and do that which his father has called him and asked him to do. Elijah became a mark man because he stood up against that which was wrong in the sight of God. Moses became a mark man because he stood up for that which was right. And I want to say this to you, even though you are hidden and you're getting ready to come out of obscurity, I want to prepare you for what is ahead. And that you're not going to come out of the shadows and into the light and you're going to be embraced. There is going to be opposition to your destiny. But I want to say this to you that, my God, if you were to take a page out of Moses and Jesus's book, and that when you find yourself going through your desert experience, you remain faithful and true to God. Remember what Nahum said to us. That if we're going to trust God, we have to be truthful and trusted. We can't just trust him and, 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 and say it with our mouth and not our hearts. Because if we trust God, just like Christian walking through the valley of the shadow of death, there is going to be lions on the side of you. And they're going to be crying at you. They're going to be growling at you. They're going to be things that they say. But if you put your feet in, my God, the imprints of others who have gone before you, I want to say this to you. You will get through this. Again, the psalmist David, he says to us, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And this is your encouragement this morning. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, and thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't care who, what, or, 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 or anything that have come and have tried to threaten you. I want to say this to you, that it is God's purpose that should dictate your next step. 
and not what anybody has to say. They can say whatever they want to say. Ultimately, it is what God has to say to you that should cause you to get up and continue to move. Because if God says it, there is no power on this earth that can stop you from getting to your destination. The only person that can disrupt your arrival to your destination, it is you and your willingness to implement disobedience on your way. If God tells you to move and to walk, you get up, you square your shoulders, and you continue to walk. The battle is not yours. It belongs to God. And as the old songwriter said, while you're walking, you put your hand in your pocket, you begin to praise him. Fight this battle for me, God, and help my unbelief. Fight this battle for me. And as you are walking, you are talking with him. And you have to just learn how to ignore. Again, he has previewed, he has given insight into who you are. We go through the preparation state, that is through the desert experience. And now you are positioned to do great things for God. All things work together for good, for them who are loved and called according to his purpose. Don't let the enemy threaten you and cause you to abort, my God, what you have been called to fix in this world. There are persons that are waiting on you to get up. There are individuals. There is a community. The, the world is waiting on you. The world is waiting on you. Sister Monica, when I get to Jamaica, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to share something with you. that I am where I am this morning, Sister Monica, because of you. We never spoke, we never spoke, but I got to a place and a point, I share this with you, and when I come to Jamaica, I'll fill in the rest of it. So Monica, I got to a place where I wanted to quit and I wanted to give up and I wanted to stop. And I got up one morning and when I begin to pray, it was you and Sister Pat Linton. And you are telling me the reason why I can't quit and I can't give up. And the more I begin to justify giving up and quitting, it's the more you sat there and you allow me to vent. And the Holy Spirit just moved through you. And you begin to tell me, Reverend Smith, here is the reason why you can't quit and you can't give up. And I just want to say, we, 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 we've never talked, but where I was in the spirit, fighting to navigate, I wanted to quit, throw the towel and give up, that's it. And you would not let me give up and quit. And so I just want to say thank you. You don't know about this. And as it was where Mary and Joseph went before Simeon, and Simeon began to tell them thing about Jesus, so it was in the spirit as I prayed. I saw you begin to share things with me about me, to which you do not know. And from that moment, I said, God, I understand that I'm hidden in you. And this message, I, I wanted to preach this a long, long time ago, but the time wasn't right. Today is the time for me to preach this. I understand that I'm hidden in you. And I understand that everything that I had to go through, if it hadn't been for the beating and the crushing, Sister Monica, this, we have olive oil because the olive has to be crushed. So I want to say this to you, as I've been saying this to everybody. Crushing, beating, being lied on, all the negative things. It is a part of the landscape of your Christian walk. But if you can take a beating, go before God, cry, tell him you want to quit. Elisha did the same thing. He told God that he wanted to quit. 
And God said, I'm not through with you yet. There is still purpose inside of you. So I want to say that to everybody listening to me this morning. That regardless of where you are, God has given the world a preview of who you are. And you go through the preparation stage to be positioned. I know that my greater is coming. I know that my greater is coming. And it's hard and it's difficult while you're in, my God, the, 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 what I would call the torture chamber. And you're going through, you're going through. And I, Sister Monica, he helped me to understand because there were certain responses that were coming up inside of me while I was navigating these difficult times. And every time I would think and want to respond in an ungodly manner, the Holy Spirit would point it out and say, that is what I'm after. That needs to come out of you. That does not need to be a part of your thinking. That does not need to be a part of your response. That does not need to be a part of you. Why? Because you are representing me and there is going to be more of what you're dealing with that you have to face. So I have to fix this now. So when you get into your tomorrow and you face these type of things, just like Paul that says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. But Paul said, I have prayed that God does not hold this to his charge. And Sister Monica, it was not an easy conversation for me to have with the Lord. Why? Because I wanted to do what I thought. I wanted to say what I was thinking. I wanted to react. I wanted to do some things. And he said, my son, when you do that, then what? You're going to misrepresent who I am in you. Sister Monica, I had to take a step back, two, three, and I had to go back in isolation for him to work on the thing. And the next time that thing came around and it tried and it tested me, I find that my response was more pleasing to him. And even though it was hard because I had to say no to me in order to say yes to him, pat me on the shoulder and said, job well done, son. So I'm standing here because I've made a decision. I've committed the rest of my life to serving him. And what you see is what you get. Saul cannot come now and clothe me, Stamonica, with anything. Allison, Saul cannot come and clothe me and say, go fight this battle with this. Because I know the God in whom I serve. I know the God in whom I serve. And I know that he will not leave me nor will he forsake me. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Father, we come before you this morning. God, I don't know where everyone is this morning. Maybe we're still at the stage where it was previewed to us who we are and who we're getting ready to be and to become. And maybe with the divine revelation that was imparted onto us in the embryonic stage, maybe we're still there and we're looking and we're saying, is this really me and what God is calling me to be and to become? And maybe we have not moved. Maybe we have not launched out into the deep. But I pray this morning, God, this morning will be the morning where, as you said to your disciples, launch out into the deep, that this morning will be the morning where we make the decision to move. Maybe, oh God, we are in the preparation stage. In that, God, we are entering into our desert experience. And while we're in our desert experience, we have to work constantly on saying no to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Just like Jesus, we are after it was previewed who he was. My God, when he became 30, he left. And the Bible said that the Holy Spirit thrust him into the desert to be tested. Maybe that's where we are, where everything inside of us that we profess, God, it is being tested. And maybe who we thought we were and the responses that we thought would come from us, God, it is not, it's, it, it, it's not evidence unto us. And so you're still holding us in that holding pattern. 
just like Moses, we are saying to ourselves, God, why am I still in this desert? It's 38 years since I've been in this desert. But Moses had to spend 40 years in there to get 40 years of Israel, to get 40 years of Egypt out of him. And God, I pray for this, those of us this morning who are now positioned to go take on the challenge and the task that you rest on our shoulders. Spirit of the living God, I'm asking you this morning, my God, that you will touch us again one more time. For the assignment, my God, that you have called us to perform. Knowing and understanding, God, you need us to be authentic in what we do for you. And I pray this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. As Nahum says to us, O oh God, that we, if we're going to trust you, we should really trust you. We don't trust you, O oh God, today and then tomorrow because Jezebel comes and threatens us. We move and we run to a place where we want to give up on the purpose that you have called us to. But I pray this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, as you started this conversation with us in Nahum chapter number one and seven, it says the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust him. Maybe it is God that we're still in our desert experience because we have not demonstrated to you in the desert that we trust you. Here is something about the desert, oh God. It's foreign to us. We don't know what to eat. We don't know what to drink. We don't know what's good, bad, or indifferent, but you will tell us. And if we will just implement and follow what you tell us to do in our desert experience, it demonstrates to you that we trust you. And so I pray over the course of this week, pray for all the challenges, oh God, that will come I pray, Lord God, that we will put our trust in you. And we too will see what the scripture says. They that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They can't be moved. I pray this morning, God, that you will help us to get to that place where we put our trust and our faith in you. Father, we look to you this morning and we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and thank you. We started out in that our Heavenly Father decided that he wanted to take us down a different path. I got out of the way and allow him to speak to us. It is my prayer that over the course of this week that you will trust God. Whatever it is that he tells you to do or ask you to do, do it because there is a reason for it. He's after those immature areas in your life and mine. Because when these tests or these that we go through, when we declare to ourselves that I am this or I'm going to do that, it's not until we're in the fire where we find that our responses are different. And when our responses are different in that the evidence, <laughs> let me put it to you this way, has the evidence of your actions ever testify against you? Have you ever said, I'm not going to do that, I will never do that, and you find yourself in a situation where your actions testify against you? God is after those immature areas in your life, and he wants them to be developed to where they're mature, to where what you say with this aligns with this. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for taking the time just to fellowship in and just be in the presence of the Lord with me. My prayer is that your heart would have been blessed. Not only that, but I want you to take the word of God. I want you to spend time with it. I want you to look at it. Look at your circumstance. Look at what God had to say about uh, to us in this session. And look at your life and see if, my God, there is any immature area that needs to be worked out. And if and when divine revelation speak to you, bring it before him, have a conversation with him, and let Jesus fix it for you. I love you. Patrick, Mr. Patrick, sir, I will see you in about a week. I'll see you. I'll see Sister Monica. 
and I just can't wait. I am looking forward to this trip. So Monica, Patrick and I, we go way back. We go back to high school, going back all the way to 1984. 1984, I've known him since 84. And even though I'm here and we have time that we have not talked with each other, we get together and we talk and it's like we never miss a beat, but I can't wait to see you guys. I love you and thank you.